I went to the doctor. I, I had a doctor for a lot of years. He was a great man. By the way, I didn't tell you. Turn to Acts chapter 10. I'm going to actually begin with a couple words from Matthew 16, but we're going to be heading to Acts 10. And y'all don't worry, I'm going to preach almost two chapters today. That shouldn't scare you. I can do two chapters faster than I can do two verses. So, um, my, my doctor and I, we, we got real close. And uh, he, he was my doctor for a lot of years. And, and uh, he was always there for me. And when uh, he was going through some very difficult times, I was there for him. And uh, all he had to do was call, and I would be there. And uh, same thing, if I needed him, he was always there. But he retired, um, and, and that's a good thing. But uh, I had to find another doctor. And I took the doctor they recommended, and uh, I, I went to see him. And one thing about my new doctor, if my appointment's at 940, I'll be in his office by 938. And when he sees you, I mean, it's usually five minutes. I mean, talk about in and out. If he worked at Walmart, there'd never be a line. <laughs> and we would just, you know, we'd, we'd go in. And one of the first times I, I got there, he looked at me. And I was looking at him. I was sizing him up. And he looked at me and he said, you ever exercise? I was almost offended. <laughs> but I hadn't been exercising, so I wasn't offended. And he said, um, we, that, that got us into one of the very longest conversations that he and I ever had. It lasted about 30 seconds. <laughs> and we got talking about diets and this fad and that fad, and everybody's got their favorite diet. Amen? My favorite diet has to do with fried chicken, banana pudding, and fried pies. <laughs> now that was an amen moment there. Amen. Come on, come on. I got to preach y'all up today. Well, he, he just looked at me in the way that... Now, by the way, he's as big as a pencil. Don't y'all hate those doctors that are as big as a pencil? Um, Jody Dale goes to the same doctor. He can, he can testify. He, um, he said, it's diet and exercise. I said, yeah, but, but all these... No. He looked at me and said, it's diet and exercise. I said, but what do you think about this thing and what do you think about this thing? He... Almost exasperated, he looked at me and said, it's diet and exercise. It's what you take in and what you burn off. You're going to be what you do. It's your diet and exercise. And I thought, all right, you're the expert. And I got thinking about it. I thought, you know, that's pretty right. Now, I'm a preacher. I can make a sermon out of anything. <laughs> if you fall in a mud puddle, I'll come up with a sermon about you falling in a mud puddle. And I got thinking, I thought, you know, spiritually, that's pretty good. You are what you are in your spiritual health by what you take in and what you do, how you walk it out, what you do with it. And as I was coming to this place in uh, Acts chapter 10, we've been going through all this. I was thinking, you know, last week I said, we're going to change the call the series. We're going to call it exercising our faith, exercising our faith. Bible study will tell you about God, but obedience will let you know God. There's a difference. Seems like in church, we want to have all the Bible studies. You can learn all the things, that, but until you get to the place of obedience, you're never going to know God, but if you want to know God, just be obedient to what He's told you and you'll find Him real quick. James chapter 2, verse 20 says, Faith without works is dead. James 2.20. The writer of Hebrews says in the 11th chapter in the 6th verse, that's the faith chapter, he says there that it is impossible to please God except by faith. If you want to please God, the only way that you're going to please God is by faith. So we're supposed to have a spiritual diet and prayer, Bible study, listening, learning. But obedience is what's going to make you healthy. Jesus was with those disciples in a storm on the sea. And they said, can't you do anything about it? And he said, peace be still. And the waves calmed down and the winds quit blowing and everything was peaceful. 
And he said, oh, you of little faith. But praise God, it was faith. I think if we have a little faith, it may grow to reluctant faith. How many of you have known what you should do, but you were reluctant to do it? I know what the Bible says, but that means you're not going to do it. Reluctant faith. But if we walk with God, we may get to that place where it can be called abundant faith. It's not seeing the impossibilities. Seeing the impossibilities are easy. Everybody can do that. But when you can look beyond the impossibilities and see Christ and see victory on the other side of circumstances, that's when your faith will grow. God is going to challenge your faith. He wants to stretch your faith. He wants you to grow your faith. And by the way, he'll make sure that you face some things to help you find that strong faith. And sooner or later, if you're walking with God, you're going to get to the place where you'll see past your circumstances and you'll see Jesus Christ. In Matthew 16, Jesus was with his disciples. You don't need to turn there. You know the story very well. He said to his disciples, who do men say that I am? Some said, oh, some say you're this person. Some say you're this person. Some say you're this person. Then Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? He was wanting them to look beyond all the sermons and, and open up to heart and see the realness of what was there. And Peter stepped up and said, you are the Christ the Son of the living God. Verse 7, Jesus answered and said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Have y'all heard this scripture? I will build my church. Christ will do it. Hell can't stop it. Verse 19, so overlook. And he says to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. A key is something that will open the door of opportunity. It, it, it opens up so that you can get to the other side of the possibilities. He said, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And he says, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. When you get to a place, when you get to a circumstance, if you'll open the door, you'll find something great on the other side. But if your faith is so limited and, and you don't think that you can, you'll bind it. You'll shut it down. But if you loose it and you walk through it, you see, what you do here will reflect what heaven, eternity will be like. And if you have a lack of faith here, there will be a lack of blessing on, in that area in heaven. But if by faith you loose it, then you're, you're loosing all of those things and the possibilities that could be in heaven. It's a time of stagnation and of binding and holding down, or it's a time of production, of blessing. It's up to you. The ball is in your hand. If you're saved, you're saved by grace through. If you walk out that life of love, yes, and trust, yes, and belief, yes, and obedience, Oh, what God can do. So in Acts 2, Peter preached a sermon to the Jews and the Holy Spirit fell and the gospel went to the Jews. The good news of Jesus Christ went to the Jews. In Acts 8, Peter took the key to the Samaritans and he preached, and God blessed, and people were saved, and the gospel went to the Samaritans. Then in Acts 10, he takes those keys again, and he opens up the door of opportunity. He didn't set this up. God set it up. But now the gospel is going to go to the Gentiles. 
Let me remind you what Jesus said before he ascended to heaven. Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power. It's not your power. You don't generate it. You just are the conduit. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, the Jews, Judea, those outer Jews, Samaria, the people you don't even like, and to the ends of the earth, the Gentiles. I don't know about you, but I'm grateful it reached us. I wasn't born into that, but I was born again into that. Oh, what God can do. Let's pray. Now, Lord, I pray that as you place the keys in our hands as well, in the world in which we live and the influence of which we've, we've been given by your grace, that we will look to you and we will find your power, your strength, your faithfulness, and your goodness. And Father, we pray for blessings for glory's sake. I pray that people will not be so lacking in faith that they will bind you up so that your work cannot be done, but they will loose you into our lives and into our circumstances so heaven and eternity will be affected. It's about us, but Lord, it's about you. So help us to see you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Acts 10, it begins with a Roman centurion. His name was Cornelius. He's down in Caesarea Philippi, and he's there. And as he, he, the Bible tells us he's a devout man, and, and he was always praying to God. And, and about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he saw a vision. Now, let me just explain this, because when God comes and God shows up, you know it's him. It says he saw a vision of an angel of God that was there with him. And he said, your prayers and your alms, your giving have come up as for a memorial before God. God sees, God's remembering. Now, send some men down to Joppa. There's a man there by the name of Peter. He's staying with a Simon the Tanner. Go down there and tell him to come. He's got something to tell you. Well, about the same time, uh, uh, the day before, about three, about noontime. Anybody here, here get hungry at noontime? I mean, some of you, when I'm preaching, you're tapping, you're watching, you're going, must. And then we get that holy sound that happens in church when all the stomachs start growling together in harmony. And they're saying, preacher, let us go. Free us, let us go, right? When, when Peter was there, but he was up on the top of the house in the heat of the day, and he's hungry, and he falls into a trance. And the Bible says, listen, heaven opened. And a sheet comes down from heaven. I mean, this has got to be a picnic, amen? A picnic from heaven. The, the, the sheet's coming down. There's food. He's hungry. And then he peeks inside the sheet. And he sees, uh-oh, wild animals, four-footed creatures, creeping things, literally reptiles, mm, and birds. Of the air. Now, if he'd have been fried chicken, I'd have been all for it. Amen? <laughs> Maybe it was swab. Anybody want to have pigeon this afternoon? I mean, they're kind of a pretty bird. I don't think I want to eat one, though. And he sees this sheet of all this food, and he's like, and, and, and the Lord says, clean and eat. You looked at it again. Not me, Lord. No. I have never eaten anything unlawful in all my life. And Jesus says back to him, hey, don't you say anything that I've created is unlawful or common. Rise up and eat. Well, Old Pete's a little stubborn. Sheet comes down again. Rise up and eat. 
No, no, no. Not doing it. Not doing it. Not doing it. I can just say, whoosh, Pete, I'm going to give you another chance. And the sheet comes down again. Now, some of us don't learn the first time. That's okay. But if God repeats himself, that should get our attention. If God says it three times, now you can be stubborn if you want to, but he's the great teacher, and he's going to get your attention, and he's going to help you understand this, and the word of God does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What we've got to do is hear the word of God, are you listening? And take it in, and then act upon it. It's diet and exercise. you got to do something with it. Now, as he wakes up from it, he hears a knocking on the door. And those Peter, the people that Cornelius had sent, they came up at just that time. And he's up on the top and he's hearing them and he's hearing the conversation. Uh, our master, a uh, centurion named Cornelius, he sent us here and we're supposed to find this guy by the name of Peter. I, I was told that he would be at your house. So Peter comes running down the stairs real quickly and he says, um, he hears their story. And then Peter did something that was kind of unusual. He let them in. Now that was unlawful for a Jew to do that. You didn't do that. You didn't have them uncircumcised people in your house. But he just had God correct him and said, don't call anything that I created common. So his first step of faith was just letting them in the house. And they come in, and this was unusual for them too. And there might have been a little bit of a sense of awkwardness. Can you hear me? Not sure about this. But yet they're open to it. And, and, and Peter says, I, uh, I'm, I'm open to whatever you want to do. Doubting. Nothing is what the Bible says. Doubting nothing. He invites them in. They eat together. They spend the night. The next day, they take off to Caesarea, where Cornelius is. They get to, Caesar they get to his house, and Cornelius sees them, and he runs to him, and he falls on his knees before him. Peter's like, get up. I'm just human like you are. Just get up. I'm here. What a, he begins to tell his story. And he said, uh, I was fasting. And I, 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 he said, I prayed in my house and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothes and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard. Your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here. This is verse 32, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house. So I sent to you immediately, verse 33. Peter says in verse 34, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. Now, I'm going to read here. I, I want you to hear what Peter says. Now, let me preface this. A lot of times when we're going to have to go to this thing called faith, we're going to be uncomfortable. But listen. Listen. What he's asking us to do is really not hard. The hard is what is on the inside, us deciding to do it. What Peter's going to do in these next few words, he had done many times before. But there's something in his flesh because he had, this goes against every bit of raising that he's ever had. Everything that he's ever saw, everything that he's ever done, it's totally against that. But all God is asking him to do is really a simple thing. Verse number 35. But in every nation, whoever fears him, that is God, and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, Hear these words. Are you listening to me? Hear the powerful words of God. He is Lord of 
Say it again. He's Lord of all. He's Lord of all. Verse 37. That word ye know which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began uh, with, from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who had been oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree." Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank uh, with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to, to testify that he is, that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets witness that through his name, Whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. Come on, he's a preacher. He, he's preached this sermon before. He's just testifying of Jesus. How long did that take me? A couple minutes? Not long. Hold on. Let's take a vote. How many of you knew that story? Raise your hand. Oh, some of y'all... Y'all are lying. <laughs> How many of you know the story of Jesus Christ? Raise your hand. Amen. If not, you need to be an altar here. We need to get this right right now. If you know Jesus, you've got a testimony of the glorious grace of Jesus Christ. How you repent of your sins, you believe in Him, right? And you ask Him to do for you what only He can, he can do to cleanse you, to forgive you, to make Him your own, His own. And God did something that may have been invisible in earth, but it will be seen throughout all of eternity. God changed your life. You know everything I just preached. Is that correct? Is it? So what you're saying is every one of you could say the same words. Yeah, I believe that he died. He was God's son. He was sent here. He died for us on the cross of Calvary. He rose again. We're all witnesses to it. Hold on. This leap of faith, and I believe personally, I know Peter walked on the water. Amen? I know he, he, he was right there with Christ. He, was, he saw miracles happen. He actually was sent out on a mission trip where he healed people. He cast out demons. I understand all that, but I think this is the greatest step of faith in Peter's life. Because now he is crossing a, a bridge that he never thought he would have to. But it wasn't hard. He, he could tell that two-minute story real quickly. That's all he did. But the hard thing happened here. Would he, by faith, be obedient? Or was he going to have to understand everything first? Was he willing to, by faith, do something that may have been uncomfortable? But Peter right now is loosening himself up to the Holy Spirit. He didn't create this. God opened the door of opportunity. I mean, the door came knocking for him. Hey, Pete, can you go? Our boss wants to talk with you. God said, send for Peter. He'll come and he'll tell you the truth that you need to hear. In Sunday school this morning, Steve Perry was share, sharing a testimony. He says, he says, Pastor, can I share a testimony real quick? Man, that's like saying sick him to a dog right there. That's like saying dinner time. I mean, yay, I'm in the front of the line. I'll be there, right? He said, I, I want to tell, tell you a tes testimony. Three times he tried to do something and it didn't work. Things that he could do all the time. But because of that, he found himself in a certain situation, in a certain place, and someone came in and began a conversation with him. Nobody went into that room that's crowded with people all the time so that they could have some pri quiet, private time together. One shares a devastating thing that's happened in his life. Steve, with tears in his eyes, began to talk with him, told him he would be praying with him. Do you think God 
is a God who doesn't do that kind of stuff all the time? You think God may be working in our circumstances? Do you think God may be bringing people? Now, how many of us would say, yes, I'm going to speak the things of Jesus that I know. And how many of us would just be reluctant and say, good weather today, isn't it? Braves didn't play yesterday, so we didn't lose. How is it that we can talk about the Braves so easily? Sports, cars, sewing. How come we can talk about politics? How come we can talk about anything, doctors, and anything, but we, we've got this great thing that's been given to us, and God puts us in this world so that we can share the good news of Christ. All right, listen. Peter gives his two or three minute sermon. Y'all with me? Verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, how dare anybody interrupt the preacher? While he's still speaking, God said, that's enough, Peter. The Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word and those of the circumcision who believed they came with old Pete. They were astonished. And as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. The Holy Spirit said, Peter, two, three minutes, that's good, but hush, I got a work of salvation that needs to be done. And the Holy Spirit fell, and they got born again right there. Now, hold on. All of us, what did Peter do? It was easy. It may have been hard to make the decision to do it. But by faith, he trusted the Lord, and he, he, set, he loosened the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came in that place, and all of a sudden now, Gentiles are getting saved. And the Jewish people that came with him, they're going, oh. they felt the same way. That's what the word astonishment means. It's a jaw-dropping moment. I've never seen it done. But that doesn't mean God can't do it. God filled their heart. God born he gave them a new birth. They were born again. And Jesus gets up from the throne of glory and begins writing names down in the Lamb's book of life. Dips his pen in the blood that cleanses from all sins. And they're there, and they're there for how long are our names in the Lamb's book of life? Say it again. Forever. What Peter did was by faith and obedience, obedience, he, he was obedient to what God had placed before him, and now souls are getting saved. If you had a conversation with old Pete beforehand, he, he probably would have said, I don't know if that can work that way. Oh, I don't know if it can work that way. Look in chapter 11. Now the apostles and the brethren who were in Judea heard that Gentiles had also received the word of God. How many of you know the word travels fast? They didn't get on their cell phone and say to Jerusalem, hey, Gentiles are getting saved. You don't have to. God can spread the word. If you release the word, God will spread the word. If you bind up the word, it dies there. And God will have to find somebody else to use. And verse 2, And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him. They argue with him. Why is it that we want to argue about that kind of stuff? Then Peter told the story, the same simple story. And you know what they did? They had a jaw-dropping moment too because they knew it was Christ and they all celebrated. Every time a soul gets saved, there's a party going on in heaven. Amen? Amen. And there should be a party in the hearts of God's people when people are obedient to the call of God and things happen. You may not see it happen immediately like Peter did, but I want you to know, faith breeds, breeds 
fruit. It won't die on the vine. Faith releases fruit of heaven. Let me ask you, what if they shut it down? What if that trance that Peter was in and he looked inside that picnic spread that God and said, no, I'm not doing that, Lord. I'm not doing it. I'm no, I'm not doing it. Not doing it. I don't care how many times you tell me I'm not doing it. I was raised this way. I'm going to be that way till I die. No pig for me. It had been shut down. It had been shut down. What if they were not willing to change? Small steps lead to large, long journeys. But Jesus said in Matthew 16, upon this rock I will build my church. He didn't tell us ten ways. But this way of faith is the foundation. On this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not, cannot prevail against what God is doing. Are you ready for God to use your faith? Are you ready for God to unleash the blessings? Sometimes we need to be stretched. Sometimes we need to look beyond the circumstances and see the possibilities because Christ is on the other side of the door. We need to open up the door of opportunities. I don't know, but I believe just about every person in this room has a little bitty light inside of them. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, right? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine. What are we going to do? Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. You know, a little spark can create a fire. Right? A little faith can grow fruit. A little life can be used. God doesn't need big shots. <laughs> Just an old fisherman like old Pete. An old callous, tan, hard-headed, stubborn, born again, bold. Oh, he hadn't always been bold. But God keeps stretching his faith. Stretching his faith. Are you willing to be used? All right, listen to this next statement. Are you willing to lay your faith on the altar and say, Lord, take this little light of mine and let it shine?